Now, with that said, let us swap over and start talking uh, about Exchange Online Protection. Now, I like to draw some models up here. So this is sort of the, the large overarching security model that I sort of start with. You'll see here that um, the first takeaway is we need to think about defense in debt. So the uh, best practice is around, it's not just one single layer, there's multiple layers here. So we need to use, you know, Exchange Online, but we also need to keep in mind that, you know, we should be using things like Intune Endpoint Manager, MFA, um, you know, Defender Application Guard, uh, Attack Service Reduction Rules, because all of those are going to provide different layers of protection. So if an email comes in, the user clicks on it, we've got protection in Outlook, we've got protection on uh, their device, Windows 10 with ASR and so on. So there's a lot that can be done here, but that can be also overwhelming because it's like, okay, what do I turn on? What's the priority here? So my advice to you would be is you want to think about security as what's the most likely point of compromise. Now, in most cases, that is going to be via an email sent to a user with some sort of link or attachment that they click on, open up, and then that compromises their machine or their identity. So you start with the most likely um, vectors of attack and you start protecting those, locking those down, and then you work through and do all the others. So if you're looking for a place to start, I think there is no better place to start than uh, Exchange Online Protection. Now, when we look at Exchange Online protection as a flow, so what happens when a mail comes in? What happens when a mail leaves Microsoft 365? So before an email you know, even is received by Microsoft 365, we really need to have protections for SPF, DKIM and DMARC set up. Now, these are DNS records which allow the security or allows the categorization or the marking, I suppose, of uh, inbound uh, emails. Very, very important. You should have one of these records uh, for each domain that you manage or use or using Microsoft 365 because they provide signals into Microsoft 365 as well as to third parties. So when you send emails, um, they will generally, if they set up correctly, they will look for SPF, DKIM and DMARC records to verify that, you know, that sending is valid. So step number one is even before we get into configuring or playing with anything or any email being received by Exchange Online, we need to set up the DNS records, SPF, SPF DKIM and uh, DMARC. Now, you'll notice here that this graphic, I've highlighted the... Uh, yellow or the tan options are the ones where a reseller or an IT pro can go in and configure, make changes. You know, they have direct control um, over these items. So without hesitation, there is the ability to manage, set up and control your SPF, DKIM and DMARC record. And you should uh, do that in your DNS management. Now, once an email is received from the internet inbound, so we're looking at the top uh, flow here, it's going to go through what Microsoft call its edge protection. Now, these are protections that are put in place by Microsoft, managed by Microsoft. There is no configuration that an IT pro can do or a customer can do, and it's going to run through a number of standard checks. We'll talk about those in a little bit more detail. It will also, you notice, run through standard virus checking. Now, it's important to note that Microsoft uses at least three independent virus scanning engines so it shares its information with other security vendors and their engines so it's not just running through microsoft av scanning it's running through you know additional third parties as well so it goes through all that before uh, it hits any of the policies uh, in exchange online protection now when it does it will then run through spam policy connection filtering policy malware policy transport rules dlp policy and spoof intelligence now all of those are largely policy driven which means somebody needs to set up configure those policies now some of these policies have default settings which are probably very average and should be uh, configured to uh, in employee more security. But you'll see there are a lot of options that it has to flow through, a lot of protections that are employed even before the email gets to the user's inbox. 
Now, likewise, on the outbound, you'll see that there are a number of additional policies there as well. So you can encrypt messages, you've got a spam outbound policy, a DLP policy and transport rules as well. So there is a lot of policies that can be configured that can be used to improve the security of uh, email as it flows in and outside of the organization. All of these are in what we call Exchange Online Protection. Now, on the other side of Exchange Online Protection, if you have an appropriate license like Microsoft 365 Business Premium, you will also have additional security uh, around the Defender for Office 365 product. Now, this is going to give you, again, additional policies for safe attachments, safe links, and anti-phishing. So as an inbound mail arrives, uh, it goes through you know, the DNS stuff, it will then go through the standard Exchange Online protection policies that I've mentioned previously. And then if you have the appropriate license, which you generally should, I would suggest, should then be sent through additional policies for Defender for Office 365, as I've indicated there, all right? So there are a lot of protections that can be put in place. Now, in essence, this is sort of how it works with inbound filtering. So when an email is received, it goes through those perimeter checks we talked about. It goes through the AV engines, as mentioned, and then it hits the transport rules. So if you have transport rules in there, uh, they will be action first. So make sure that your transport rules make sense and you haven't set those up to accidentally bypass all the other filtering. So for example, like I said, you can set up transport rule which bypass uh, every other policy after that if you wish. So again, if you do have them in there, be very careful with them. Now we go through our standard you know, spam protection and SPF. You'll see where the SPF there uh, is super important because it's going to do an evaluation again on what the SPF setting is of the inbound uh, message. You'll also see we do bulk mail filtering. Now, the other thing we'll do is you see there's an international spam option here. Now, by default, the policies out of the box are not going to restrict messages from any country or in any language. Now, to me, I would suggest to you that you need to look at restricting the languages and the locations from which emails are received. So if you don't expect to receive you know uh, emails from russia or in russian then probably a good idea not to or to prevent those from being delivered you can do that with this international uh, this filtering using uh, the international locations then once all of that is done through various policies which we'll look at in more detail shortly it goes through advanced threat protection which is now uh, defender for office 365 the safe attachments and safe links all right so You'll see it flows through quite a number of processes before. Now, the challenge here is remember that all of those configurations require a policy. You know, someone has to set up the policy, they have to put the settings in place in the policy, so it requires management. Now, what we see is, is that many of these aren't adjusted and set to best practices, and that's why uh, you know some of the bad stuff can get through exchange. And typically, it's because the you know the best practices haven't been applied. Now, likewise, on the outbound filtering, it goes through AV scanning again. You've also got the custom rules, transport rules again, uh, and you've got you know the spam analysis, and then it will go outbound. Now. What we've seen is, again, why outbound filtering is important because if a user gets compromised for some reason, the attacker may be able to use their mailbox to send bulk spam to additional people outside the organisation. So having the ability to filter or monitor or report on uh, what's happening from the mailbox out to the internet is also very important because if we suddenly get thousands and thousands of messages being sent you know, every uh, in per minute, per hour, we want to know about that and we want to also prevent that. So that's why, you know, outbound filtering is so important as well. Now, Microsoft gives us a, you know, a layered approach here. So these are all the items here broken down into, um, you know, individual components. You'll see there's a hell of a lot here. We'll work through these uh, in a little bit more detail shortly. But what I want to call out is if you put some sort of mail filtering product in front of Exchange Online, you are going to neuter or reduce the effectiveness of everything that is noted here. So the number one point to take away here is there is no requirement to have any sort of third-party filtering in front of Exchange Online. 
and the caveat is provided exchange online and things like defender for office 365 uh, basically is there to provide additional uh, protection. So I've got a question about, do you think Windows Defender is good solution for AV and malware? Absolutely. It is the best product on the market. If you do any research, you look at all Microsoft products, they are at industry or well above industry standards. So without doubt, there is no need for any third party solution, email filtering, uh, anything that's required on the device um, as well. However, the caveat to all of that is like any product, it needs to be configured to best practices. So you can have the world's greatest product, whatever that may be, but if it's not configured to best practices, then um, it's not nearly as good as it could be. So again, make sure that you do configure whatever products you choose to best practices. But the answer to the question is yes, Microsoft Defender products are beyond, in my opinion, the average uh, industry standard. So if we break these down a little bit, just to give you a quick idea, I'll run through these uh, quite quickly. Um, Microsoft will give us network throttling, so that's going to prevent things like denial of service. We're also going to get this IP reputation and throttling, so these are the edge protections that Microsoft provides that you can't or someone can't go in and configure. We've also got the reputation, so Microsoft maintains a list of known good and bad domains and it will you know, take policy or take uh, emails from the good ones. We've also got edge-based filtering, all right? So that uh, potentially is where an attacker can sort of connect to Exchange Online and then do a query to try and work out what mailboxes are there, so they prevent that. And we've also got uh, the reduction in backscatter uh, attacks as well. We've also now, when you go to the sender intelligence level, here you're going to have SPF, DKIM and DMARC. So once again, Exchange Online, all the policies are going to utilize the settings for SPF, DKIM and DMARC set in the DNS. Now, if these aren't set, then you're not gonna get any advantage of them. So this is why it's so important to set these as part of the process, as part of the focus of making sure that your email settings and your email security is as tight as possible. The good thing about these DNS records is you only have to set them once. Uh, once they're configured, you generally don't have to go back in and uh, adjust them at all. We also get the ability to have spoof intelligence so that someone pretending to be from inside the organization. We get the cross domain spoofing. So if you've got contacts in Microsoft 365 that are trying to spoof you for some reason, like someone has a compromised account that is detected. We're also going to have this bulk email filtering. So this is going to prevent you know, spammers sending you know, large amounts of newsletters and things at, it, up, at uh, users. We've got mailbox intelligence. So the idea here is that uh, Microsoft will track using the graph the interactions that people have with others. So if you start emailing somebody regularly, that then has a much uh, higher confidence of being good than uh, one that one that has never you've never seen before. So that's sort of the concept behind that. We've also got the ability to prevent user impersonation. All right. So remember the idea here is you can actually go into Exchange Online and mark or tag your high priority accounts. Now they're typically going to be the CEO, the accountant, uh, the accounts person who does the banking uh, and so on. That's going to provide an additional layer of protection on top of what's normally there. So uh, that uh, basically is going to give those accounts an extra focus uh, in the Microsoft Exchange Online protection. Whoopsie. And we've also got the ability to, the Microsoft will be detecting and looking for the uh, domain impersonations there. Again, now we've got the ability where you can go as IT Pro and set configurations for transport rules. We talked about that. We've got our AV engines. Remember, there are multiple AV engines that Microsoft use. We can also go in here and you know block certain types of attachments. So if you don't want GZIP, if you don't want uh, things like PSTs, you can block those at the boundary. We've also got reputation blocking uh, as well. So we can look at the reputation of the attachments, uh, where they're coming from and determine whether to allow them through. Heuristics is based on looking at the overall exchange online. So for example, if an attacker you know, uh, sends out a bulk email to thousands and thousands of Office 365, Microsoft 365 Exchange Online people, that's going to be detected. And Microsoft's going to say, hang on, we're seeing a lot of this you know, similar email being blasted at our users. Uh, we'll do extra analysis. We'll uh, block that from additional users coming in. So they can look across all of their mailboxes 
and create rules and learnings uh, across that. We've got good old machine learning, AI, AI, AI everywhere, as they say. And uh, we've got reputation blocking as well. Uh, other links in there of a good reputation. We can also uh, look at the content heuristics. So content heuristics is again around, okay, is the message had the right spelling? Is it, you know, paragraphed correctly? Is it formatted like a human being would versus a machine or an attacker? We've got safe attachments. So again, this is part of Defender for Office 365. So this is technically out onto Exchange Online. Same with um, the link de detonation there. And we also have the um, capability to verify all that before the user actually receives that. We've got the ability to have our safe links. Again, that is part of the uh, option in Defender for Office 365. So we get a basic level of URL detection and reputation with Exchange Online, but we add more when we add safe links. So safe links actually runs it through a proxy. So the user clicks on it, you'll see it go through a Microsoft proxy. If it's verified as good, then we'll allow that. Now the advantage of Exchange Online, sorry, the Defender for Office 365, is it will look much deeper along the link chain. So what the attackers do is they send one link that links to another link that links to another link that links to another link to try and trick users and prevent detection. So uh, safe links with Defender Office 365 will look a lot deeper than the standard exchange online. We've also got something known as ZAP. So that's zero hour auto purge. Now, what that means is if Microsoft finds a, an email or whatever that was uh, determined as bad after the fact, after it actually has been delivered to a user, they'll remove it automatically from the email, uh, from the inbox. You can control that as an administrator if you want to. So you can determine whether Zap applies or not. I would generally recommend that you do because if bad stuff is detected after the fact, you want it removed as quickly as possible. Now you should also remember that there is also protection in the client. So in Outlook, on the desktop and on the mobile device, there's also additional protection as well as the protection via the operating system, things like uh, ASR to uh, prevent macros and that launching. So there's a lot of protection there. Now, what I wanna focus on is where the policies are located in Exchange Online here. So this is what I find is generally not in there and configured appropriately. So people just go in, set up Exchange Online, and then they leave the defaults, they don't make any changes. That is like you know running up a version of windows putting it on the internet without hardening it locking it down uh doing best practices so same thing applies here now the good thing was microsoft's done you'll notice when we go into this you'll see up the top there under the threat policies we've got the preset um policies as well as a configuration analyzer now microsoft has given us two preset security policies one called standard and one called strict now they have a number of settings and obviously the standard is a little bit uh, less or a little bit uh, not um, as locked down as strict so what you can do is rather than having to worry about do i set this to this level do that if you apply these then what will happen is those policies will be enabled in your environment and they'll be set to the appropriate best practices settings as defined uh, by microsoft again i've got a link to the document they use uh, in there if you want that now, the downside to this, unfortunately, is that once you apply one of these standard policies, you can't actually go in and edit it and maybe tweak it a little bit to suit your environment. That is a bit of a limitation, unfortunately. So my advice to you is, is you take those standard and strict settings, you set them up yourself as your own custom policy, and then if you want, you can go in and make additional configurations or make it even more secure if you want. So that's what I've done. I've taken the strict option and then turned on additional features to make it even stricter because it's got that flexibility. But if you want out of the box, there is the option there to apply one of these uh, standard policies from uh, Microsoft. And again, you'll see the link down there if you wanna go straight to that location. Now, the other option that was listed there is the configuration analyzer. So what the configuration analyzer will do for us is it will look at your existing policies, your existing environment, and then it will give you an analysis and it will say you are not at these best practices you are not at an appropriate level this should be changed this should be enhanced so think of it like a secure score in inverted commas for your exchange online now the really good thing about this configuration analyzer is the fact that you can push a button select an option and it will automatically 
enable that setting for you. So if you do accept the option there and you want to go in and, and uh, configure it, you can do it directly from this configuration analyzer. And again, we'll have a look at that. This is part of every exchange online. So certainly I would encourage you, if you haven't done it already, go in, run that and see firstly whether your environments are at best practices and then you can make adjustments there if you wish. Now, the other thing I'll call out here is the mail flow reports. It's very, very important to know what's happening inside your uh, email environment. And all the reports here are going to give you the capability and go in and do analysis for, you know, what's happening in the real, you know, what's happening day to day, but also things like are there security issues or are there failures or are there things that I need to know about, bulk mail being sent by a user in my environment or something. So again, the idea here is that you can use these reports and you should use these reports on a regular basis to monitor your environment. They're all included. They're all part of the system. But again, I find that many people aren't aware of them and don't look at them regularly. Now, if you use or you license uh, Defender for Office 365 uh, P2, so this is not part of uh, Microsoft 365 Business Premium. It is part of E5. It's going to give you the ability to basically test your users to see whether they fall for phishing scams. So you can basically go in here and create and run your own attack simulations. Now, again, calling out, you will need Defender for Office 365 P2 to do this. But you'll see here that you're able to select a technique. You're able to craft an email uh, in here. You'll see you've got uh, listings of your attack simulation training, uh, the campaigns you've launched, the result. You can customize it. You can actually now also take a known spam. So if someone has sent you a phishing attack, you can take that, import that into the attack simulator, customize it for your own environment, and then blow it out to your user. All of this is happening internally. So they actually see you know, a real world uh, phishing attack, what it's like. Now, the other really good thing about the attack simulation training is the fact that uh, not only are you able to send these tests to users, you're also able to capture that information, who clicked on it, who didn't, and then you can also set up a uh, policy so that if they do click on an email, they are taken through or required to go through a, a training exercise. So they can be required to complete training before um, you know they continue on and a manager can uh, monitor and maintain that. Excuse me. Sorry for that, just needed to have a bit of a cough in the background. So you can set up a whole training program using Defender for um, Office 365 P2, rather than having to go out and buy, purchase and use the third party product. The big advantage here is all done inside the tenant, all the training, uh, all the management, all the configuration reporting is done uh, inside the Microsoft environment. So really, really handy. Uh, capabilities and you know a single point of touch, a single license, a Microsoft license, uh, and so on to achieve that. So with all that, why don't we quickly go out and have a look at this in the real world? So let's close out uh, this, go back to the account that we have here. So what I've done is I've logged into uh, Demo Tenant here. You see I've gone to security.microsoft.com. If I scroll down here to policies and rules, and you'll find that under email and collaboration, here are the preset security policies that um, I talked about. So we have the built-in protection, and then we have the standard protection. If you scroll down, you'll see here is the strict protection. So if I go in here and select the option for manage, you'll see I'm taken through a wizard to go and apply those policies and make a number of simple uh, adjustments there if you want. I am not a fan of wizards, I must admit, for various reasons, um, because I think it's sort of, um, when it comes to important security settings, it's important to know what they actually are. But if you do want to do it, you can certainly go in uh, and apply those. 
The caveat to remember is if you do apply any of these preset security policies, you can really make no adjustments except by using this wizard to achieve that, which I think is a bit of a limitation personally. Now here's our configuration analyzer. So this is going to go off and have a look at the environment. You'll see here it's uh, comparing against standard and against strict recommendations, so a bit of a secure score as I mentioned. So you'll see here that I've got, you know, three anti-spam, 11 anti-phishing and one safe attachments that it reckons because it does have Defender for Office 365. So if I select this one here, you'll see I've when I select it, I've now got the ability to apply that recommendation. So if I select that, it's going to go in and apply that setting to my policy already. And if we go across here, you'll see that it says at the moment that policy is set to move to junk rather than quarantine uh, the email. So the preference is uh, best practice is to put in quarantine rather than junk mail. So that's why it's sort of complaining about that. But if I wanted to change that, then I could simply just select that option uh, and then basically go in uh, and apply you know, apply that recommendation. So it can go in and configure the policies to best practices for you or, or judge your policy versus both the standard and the strict best practice from Microsoft. Now, you can also go in here and, <coughs> excuse me, look at, um, you know, the drift. So as if you set something up and it changes over time, you can measure that, what's it, how's it drifted away, what's the history um, of uh, the policies over time. So again, very handy feature. So you'll find those once again at security.microsoft.com under policies and rules here. All right, and then go into threat policies and again, preset security policies and configuration analyzer. So let's look at anti-spam, which is probably the most common. So let's click on anti-spam. Now you'll see firstly that you can have multiple policies here. All right, so you can have as many policies as you want. You can target those policies at different groups of users or different conditions if you want. Again, best practice uh, recommendation would be to have, you know, as few policies as is absolutely necessary because you have to maintain them. Now, if we look at, you'll see ones here that are called default. So we can't largely change these default ones. Uh, sorry, we can't delete them. We could go in here and click on them and you'll see in here, we can go in and configure these options. Now, personally, I like to leave these as they are. And I also then like to go in and add my own best practice inbound and outbound uh, policy. So you'll see here that um, I have determined the URLs that I want to protect, so typically all of them. And then this is how I want to deal with the bulk email spam. All right, and to edit any of these, all I need to do is to go down and edit, <laughs> excuse me, these thresholds here. All right, and you'll see here that I'm basically blocking things from every country that doesn't generally speak English as an example. Uh, you may want to go in and change, you know, things like SPF hard fail as well. Uh, in here, that's uh, a setting from that Microsoft recommends to be off, but I would certainly recommend it would be on uh, for most people. But remember, setting anything on here is going to make your environment more secure and potentially generate more failures. So you may end up with more people uh, coming to you sort of saying my emails or these emails are not getting through. So again, beware, there's always a trade-off here. All right, so you can go in and you can modify any of these. You can create, you know, as many of these policies that you want. You see in here, you've got allow and block domains. I would, again, strongly recommend that there is no white listing and no black listing done in any of these policies. You can but you shouldn't because that overrides these policies. So do not uh, at any stage whitelist or blacklist domains. Let the policies, let the intelligence, let the machine learning uh, handle all of that. Now, if we look at the outbound spam uh, policy, again, we target the domains. You'll see down here that we have the ability to restrict uh, sending how much emails users can send per day. So again, if we scroll down, oops, sorry. Thought I had going to maybe it's no, where is it? Oh, here it is up the top. So you'll see here that I go in and set the message limits. Now, by default, there is no message limit, which means if a user is compromised, they can send potentially an unlimited amount of emails outbound from the service, which is I don't think is a good idea. So I would strongly suggest that you go in and configure the outbound spam rule to limit 
the number of messages that can be sent per day, right? So, and also uh, per hour. So the way I calculated it was is <clears throat> if a user was to send, you know, say an email every, you know, minute or every two minutes, um, that is, you know, 30 email messages per hour times, you know, let's say, you know, seven hours work per day, they really shouldn't be sending more than 200, let's double that, say 400 messages a day. Uh, I'd be putting the limits, you know, at that sort of uh, level to start with, but it's up to you. But remember, that potentially can have an impact if somebody's sending bulk. So if you have, <coughs> excuse me, a user who needs to send hundreds of emails or, you know, bulk conf confirmations, that may affect them. So you need to go in and configure these appropriately for your organisation. But me, inside my own environment, these are the settings I have. I have 90, 90 and no more than 750. OK, and you'll see here we can restrict users who reach that message limit. So the idea here is you, if they reach that limit, that threshold, then they are unable to send mail further, <coughs> more mail. I think that's a good thing because I think I start complaining that I can't sell mail, you'll know about it. But you can also see here that you can restrict the user from sending mail until the following day or you can just set it as an alert. So it's up to you. But personally, I want to be restricting them from sending any email so that I know it's happening. There's also the forwarding rules here. So in this case, I've got forwarding turned on, but you typically want to have it off. What that means is that prevents a mailbox forwarding to, for example, the Gmail account or whatever, okay? Now, typically, it will be set to automatic. So the system changed probably about two, two and a half years ago from allowing forward to blocking forwarding. So if you do want to forward, which, again, is not recommended, not a best practice, you would need to go in here and turn on the capability to allow emails to be forwarded outside the organisation. Typically, that's where someone wants a copy of the email into you know uh, another mail system so we go in here and we set our inbound spam rule we set our outbound spam rule okay and again you'll see these then execute and you'll see there's a priority here as to when they execute so it'll fall through the <coughs> the those ones before it gets to the default now the last one that i'll call out here that again i don't see a lot of people going in configuring is the connection filtering policy Fairly simple because what it does, it allows you to potentially block or, uh, you know, uh, whitelist or blacklist <coughs> known IP addresses. Again, you shouldn't be whitelisting or blacklisting anything in here at all. Let the policy, let the machine intelligence deal with it. However, the only time that I could see it being justified or it would make sense, if you have an e-commerce server that needs to send Email confirmations to users, you could put the IP address of the web server in there. So that is allowed to send effectively unauthenticated emails to Exchange Online and then they can be sent out from there. But anything else, I wouldn't be putting anything in here. The one I want to call your attention to is this safe lists. All right, so I don't think that is on by default. If we mouse over it, hopefully it would tell us. It might not at the moment. Why do I turn it off and turn it on? Basically, Microsoft maintains a list of known good email servers, okay? Now, these are ones that have good reputation, are well-maintained, up-to-date, patched, or whatever. If the mail inbound is received from one of those servers, then that is going to mean that its confidence of being a trusted email source are going to be much higher, which will mean the delivery of emails through to your users. If that's not checked, then it has to go through all the policy, you know, all the normal policy check and generally be considered bad. So think of this switch as, okay, if that's on and it comes from a known good mail server, then I'm going to trust that rather than think of it as potentially being bad out of the box. So <clears throat> I would suggest to you go in and make sure that your connection filter policy uh, has this option turned on. It's going to make life so much easier, make the filtering and allow Microsoft to use its known uh, list of good mail servers and that's going to speed emails and reduce the amount of uh, false positives uh, that you get. All right, so that's the anti-spam policies. You've got inbound, outbound and a connection filter policy in there. Now you'll see here is our anti-malware policy. Again, multiple policies. I like to go in and create my own best practice. 
we'll see here again we target specific domains now the real one here to configure is this is so this is where you can configure zap so when it goes in after the fact it removes emails here if needed all right you'll see here we've also can control the quarantine uh, policies if you want we've also got notification uh, text that appears that you can go in uh, and configure there and our one here up the top is this is where you can go in and block um, particular attachments so again best practice advice is most attachments you don't need to go and receive so if we click the option here you'll see you can actually add a custom one and you can go in and add all of the ones that make sense here microsoft gives you a uh, quite a range to block so again if you don't need mde which i believe is an access database um, environment or attachment um, then i would certainly be going in and blocking that so there's quite a range here however again remember that if we go down the list here i don't know if it's in here let's have a look uh, no so if you for example want to receive um visio then you may need to adjust uh, things like this to allow visio documents to get through but this is you know an edge basic thing is no attachment that has this extension or is of this file type will actually uh, be blocked and you'll see here you can reject the message or if it does include that attachment you can quarantine it so the user can then make a judgment uh, over it so that is the malware policy relatively simple okay but again a very important part of the defense uh defense in depth here and don't forget there are menu options uh, up here as well we can disable policies uh if we need to so that's our anti-malware our anti-phishing again is very interesting capabilities it needs to be configured again you can create your own policies which i've done here and if we go in here and uh, edit these this is where you can go in and say, right, this is the threshold as to how aggressive I want to be when I think it's a phishing. So using all the intelligence, the machine learning, AI, all of that capability in Exchange Online, I can set the aggressiveness as to whether I think it's, you know, I will treat it as uh, phishing. OK, so generally my advice is you want it to be three or four, uh, and that's really going to make sure that anything that is suspect in any way doesn't get through or is sent to the appropriate quarantine if needed so you'll see here you can protect um, your users there you can also protect the domains that should all be fairly standard you can enable mailbox intelligence again you'll see they're all recommended settings go in make sure they are set and spoof intelligence as well so all the recommended stuff definitely should be um, turned on to uh, reach best practices okay so think of phishing the anti-phishing is a bit more um it's not as defined. So spam is, you know, if it's this level, reject it. Whereas anti-phishing is a bit more, um, you know, we have to make a informed decision as to what gets through. We have to adjust that um, as required. Now, if you do have <coughs> Defender for Office 365, as I have here, you would need to go in and create a safe attachments policy. So all of this is policy driven. You have to go in and create the policies and if we can go in here and edit this policy you'll see you want to make a decision as to <clears throat> if something is uh, suspect am i going to allow it through monitor block it or do dynamic delivery am i going to deliver it to quarantine am i going to redirect it to an administrator's mailbox uh, and so on so again there are those two policies here uh, when we when we add Defender for Office 365, we get the safe attachments and the safe links here. And again, they're all driven uh, by policy. Someone has to configure, set them to uh, best practices, right? You'll see under here, we've got the ability to uh, allow, have allow and block lists. I'm generally against this. Let the algorithm do what it needs to do. But if you really need to, um, you can go in and do that. The email authentication settings here, you can go in and this is where you would go in and set uh, DKIM. So this is where you can go in and set, you see I've set DKIM up for my domains in there. So that's where you need to make sure it is configured to take additional advantage of it and inform Microsoft 365 that that is uh, basically set up. Your advanced delivery is largely, if you want to do something tricky, typically with on-prem, you want to do forwarding of emails from on-prem servers. We can have our exchange uh, filtering here. 
All right, so again, you've got this capability if you want to add this uh, additional uh, filtering for what's called the connectors. Connectors are largely connecting to uh, other mail servers out there that you trust. Again, we've got our quarantine policies, how long is this in quarantine, are the users informed, are the administrator informed, uh, and so on. And you'll also notice we've got an evaluation uh, mode down here. All right. So all of this is in security.microsoft.com. It is in the email and collaboration section here. You'll see you've got investigations. You can explore uh, the email traffic. You can uh, basically look at attacks, campaigns that are targeting you, any threat tracker. And here's our uh, mail trace in there as you want. If you do have Exchange on Defendant for Office 365 P2, you'll see in here that we also get our attack simulation training. But most of the stuff is going to be here under policies and rules and under the threat policies there as well. I'd certainly recommend you uh, think about setting up the appropriate alert policy as well. But uh, for our Exchange Online stuff, these are where the policies are that can be set. Now, all of those policies can be configured in the GUI as I've done there, but you can also manipulate them uh, using PowerShell. So that's generally the way I do it. You get consistency every time automation. Now, as we're winding up, I will also call your attention to what I would suggest are two must-have add-ins for your uh, Outlook environment. That is uh, what's called report message and also the message header analyzer. The report message allows you to flag junk, spam, phishing, or whatever, have that reported to Microsoft, initiate automated investigations of those. The, advanced, uh, the message header allows you to look at the SPF, the DKIM, uh, why it was flagged as spam or malware or whatever. It's really good for troubleshooting. The other thing I would call your attention to is make sure that all the client tips, warnings are turned on in all of those policies. So you give your users as much information, as much help as possible. I will also tell you I am not at all a fan of adding a custom header um, to an email. I think my suggestion to you is, is you need to let Exchange do that. The reason is if you put a custom header in, then your users get uh, familiar with that and then begin to trust that an attacker will then use that potentially to try and trick your users. So again, allow the Exchange Online system to stamp the emails, apply these warnings and so on. Do not create your own custom ones because they can be spoofed, they can be used against you. We're seeing that uh, more and more and more. And the reason is, is those custom ones, when a user applies, an external user applies to an internal email, the attacker gets to see what your header is and then simply copies the codes and then uses that against you. Whereas all of these client tips are only visible to the email inside the environment or inside Outlook, right? So that's the logic behind that. So if you are doing that, I don't think it's best practice. So here are some really important links. I have written a six part blog series on end to end email protection. I'd encourage you to go look at it. It goes into a hell of a lot more detail, end to end emails, all the protections, all the things to turn on from uh, DNS all the way to the stuff you turn on on the desktop. The recommended settings for Exchange Online Protection and Defender for Office 365 are in this link here. So that's where you'll find the strict and the standard settings. That's all the granular settings. So my advice is take those, create your own policies and use that as your standard so you can modify and tweak it uh, if you need to. You'll also see a best practices here around Exchange Online, you know, how to set it up, how to configure it in general. And another really important one is the order and precedence of email protection. So what comes first? Is malware first? Is anti-spam? Is connection filtering? This will tell you how the rules or how the policies are processed, what takes process uh, first. And then if there's a match, does it fall through the other policies or does it actually skip out and continue on to the next level? So really, really important to understand the order and the precedence because there are times when you've created a policy that may not actually be executed because a policy of higher precedence has, you know, taken effect and the email has skipped anything uh, below it. So I think that's a very important document to make sure you're familiar with. Now, as always, there are additional resources from me, my blog, uh, you know, videos, tutorials, eBooks, uh, podcasts that I do regularly, and also the Academy for Online Training. Don't forget my GitHub, uh, lots of cool stuff up there that's freely available for me on my GitHub repo. 
And again, if you want to be up to date with everything happening in Microsoft on a daily basis, lots of things happening around Build. They've all gone into the Patreon community. Take advantage of that. Share your knowledge, your expertise, your learnings, and your questions with other people who are focused on the Microsoft Cloud. Again, uh, multiple levels of subscriptions available to you and encourage you to sign up for that to get all the information and free access to every recording of these webinars made as part of the benefit for that subscription. Now, with that, we've come to the end of our time. I make it almost time at the top of the hour. I will throw it open to any questions we have before looking at closing it off. 